We're getting deeper into the circular economy now from talking about the supply chain, end of life. I mentioned it, packaging, plastics, big problem. Let's also start there with the big picture. What's happening in this field right now? Maybe, Anna, you want to get started. Yes, I mean, um, a lot of uh, corporates are, or many, I think all of the corporates or brand owners are talking about packaging and, and uh, uh, yeah, redesigning their packaging in a way that it doesn't annoy their customers anymore. I think the, the demand really comes from the end customers. So maybe that we can um, say in the very beginning that... Um, also, our customers, they approach us because they say our, at the end consumers, they hate plastic and we need to change something. So I think everyone is looking for solutions. I think we can conclude that. Um, and um, I mean, we talked with, I think, every big brand in this world who is pro polluting the, the oceans and the environment at the moment. So, yeah, it, everyone is searching for solutions, but it's not easy to find solutions. Everyone is searching for solutions. I think that's a good word because there are a lot of different solutions out there, right? Whether that comes to replacing plastics, other packaging solutions. Carla, how do you perceive this then? Um, solutions out there, what's happening in the field? Yeah, there are very uh, many solutions in the field. Uh, at Otto, we are looking uh, in this field uh, for solutions. And um, the topic uh, packaging is one of our focus uh, topics in our strategy, in our sustainability strategy. And um, yeah, we want to change uh, something. And this is why we, we look up in the market. They are very cool startups. And uh, this is why we have corporations like with uh, Traceless and also with the startup Wild Plastic. I think Chris is sitting there. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So a lot of things happening, uh, Anna, you basically take an approach from the lab and working on something for quite some time. Then you came up with traceless. You say it's not a bioplastic, it's not a bio-based plastic, it's just traceless. Maybe you need to get us into this world. I had chemistry in school, but that's a long time ago. I'm trying to get into, maybe not everybody's in that field, but what are the differences out there? Because also consumers, you said, are asking for it, but we as consumers are sometimes also confused what solutions are. And yeah, that's totally understandable because it is also really confusing and, and complicated. I mean, maybe I, I can make it, um, um, explain it a little bit. So um, what we did was, or maybe where I come from, maybe I start with that, where I come from is uh, the design principle of cradle to cradle. I don't know if that was here on topic on stage today yet, but um, according to the cradle to cradle principles, it's not that complicated anymore. According to cradle to cradle, you have products that are designed either for the technical or the biological cycle. So you look at the use case, if the product is um, used in a closed loop system, you can use the technical cycle, design a product that is made from mono materials that can be really recycled for 100% and the closed uh, loop is closed. Um, if the material ends, might end up in nature or if it is consumed or if it cannot be designed for recycling, then you need the biological cycle where you use bio-based resources you produce a product and afterwards it can be reintegrated into nature's biological cycle. Um, and uh, after spending many years in the cradle to cradle NGO and, and having this uh, mindset, this circular mindset um, in my brain, I, I discovered a, a technology um, for the biological cycle, a, a biomaterial that is made from agricultural byproducts um, and that is uh, yeah, ba basically just consists of natural polymers, so no synthetic um, man-made uh, uh, artificial polymers that nature doesn't know. This is basically what we do different to bioplastics. Bioplastics are synthet synthetically produced, also sometimes useful, but for use cases where they end up in the environment, um, nature doesn't know them and they um, cause a trace. So that's um, what we do differently. Our material is traceless in nature because it's made from natural polymers. And thus we have a solution for the biological cycle of things. So for products that easily end up in the environment or just cannot be recycled. I think we had the topic of the um, yeah, lightweight films in small, um, small size. They don't get as recycled at all in Germany. Um, packagings, multi-layer packagings are not recyclable. Or of course, all these... Um, I think it's two truck loads per minute of plastic waste that ends in the environment every minute. Um, yeah, for these 
applications, we need materials for the biological cycle, and this we do. Because it's really interesting, right? Um, plastics is everywhere. I mean, it has a lot of benefits, but it's not just replacing it in some parts of our daily life, but we see it all over. And that's why we need to find these solutions that are then traceless and go back to that biological cycle. So you've been working together on, um, with basically you with Traceless have been working on many different applications, but then with Otto together on a specific solution. I think it's also good to show it because it makes it tangible. It's this <laughs> sure. packaging solution. Uh, yes. um, tell us a little bit more about this. So I think we started the cooperation four years ago. So even before we found the company and it's um, maybe to start with that, it's very important for startups, for new solutions to, yeah, to have the support from corporates to, to test their solutions and to that yeah, corporates also need to be brave and just start working together with, with new solutions. We um, d developed this, or it was from the very beginning unclear that Otto wanted to have a, a delivery bag because that's a pain for Otto to have um, yeah, pl pl uh, like basically plastic or in, in, the, in the very beginning virgin plastic, now recycled plastic, but still the consumers perceive it as, as uh, negative. So um, we developed a first prototype for this delivery bag. We had the, the issue that our material is translucent, so you can see through. So that's why we combined it with grass paper, with a thin layer of grass paper, and developed this um, delivery bag together with Otto as a prototype. Um, yeah, so that we, we did last year. And uh, of course, it was a long learning as well. So what the corporate needs and, and how the customer perceived that it's a new product, it's yellow. Um, so we did some, some market tests as well. To, um, to see if, if basically consumers are ready, ready to also have a little difference in the product. For example, a yellow product instead of a white product. So, and we're continuing this development at the moment to also get rid of the resi residual paper inside because that's even more sustainable to have it just out of this trace of material because the footprint of our material is very, very good. So it's uh, over 90% less CO2 emissions compared to plastics, for example. Um, and that's why we want to make now a fully traceless uh, delivery bag. This is what we are working on at the moment. Let's <laughs> give applause. Carla, the both of us, we now take the consumer perspective. So we get the bag. What do we do then? We throw it in the garden. What, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> the perfect way is that uh, you can uh, throw this uh, bag into your own compost. But not every person has a compost in their, in their garden. <laughs> Um, yeah, but um, the goal is that uh, this bag uh, goes into the waste management of uh, bio, bio waste, but um, this is still uh, a big topic because the waste management is not, um, I don't know, not, not have a fear about uh, biodegradable uh, materials, new innovative materials, and this is why we have to talk with the waste management, the politicals, um, about new materials, about the new uh, waste management. Uh, so this, um, like this, um, bags can throw into a biological circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're talking a lot about partnerships here, and there's like consensus we need partnerships in the circular economy with competitors and so on. What I like about this collaboration here, and Anna, you mentioned it, that even started before you already founded Traceless. Yeah. With a very small piece of material. Anna, uh, Anna came to us with a very small piece of Traceless. And uh, you were convinced. Yes. You were like, let's go for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, exactly. That, that's what's needed, right? Because the solutions, I mean, if they were ready, then everyone would use them at the moment. So, and um, when, when we first met, as Carla just said, I had a little piece of sample in my hand and say, and I was, still was a scientist, not an entrepreneur. So I said, um, okay, Otto, I have something here, but I don't know if it's going to work out and maybe it's not going to work out. But still, <laughs> you said, well, but let's try it together. And that's, that was basically also kind of the, the kickstart to think about founding the company, right? So I mean, imagine that wouldn't have happened, that you would have said, well, just come back when you're ready. And maybe it wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had the idea to start the company. It's so important for the corporates to look for solutions, to also try out new things, to be brave. I mean, it also, it, it costs time, it costs money to, to try out and search for these new solutions. But we cannot lay back and say, yeah, come to us when the solutions are ready, because uh, that's not going to work out. And maybe just to tweak it a little bit, not just to look for solutions, but the difference is to look for potential solutions. That's maybe also a big misconception out there that we're looking for ready solutions, right? It's out there, the new packaging solution, the new car, startup is fixing it. But in your case, also, it's a potential solution. 
And that's something we probably need to change more within the corporate world. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, maybe the corporate world then first. <laughs> Carl is like, yeah. Um, I think it's so important that the that the companies try new solutions. Um, and it's not uh, always a ready solution uh, that we can produce, and uh, all is fine. Um, I think it's so important that we we talk with the with the startup to develop um, the, uh, a common solution for our problem uh, in this field, the, the packaging. Yeah, and and it's okay to make failures. It's okay to uh, that that we have big issues in the development, but uh, yeah, that's the way. <laughs> so, which is unfortunately not always the case, right? It's yeah. okay to make failures. Maybe that's still a corporate mindset, but maybe under you want to add. Yeah, I mean, and, and the the difference is that companies like Otto, um, I mean, still family owned, um, they started decades ago to decide we want to have yeah have a sustainable business. We want to choose our business model and our uh, like vision for our business to be s sustainable and wrote it into their DNA. And this is so important. And we, we also realized that with partners and customers who are not family owned and um, rather maybe run by um, short term visions, um, that it's completely different, that it, it needs to be really anchored in the DNA that mm -hmm. they want, they have the vision of a completely sustainable, regenerative uh, business model, and then um, these collaborations can start a, um, as we have them here. Mm. However, what's still also difficult is to acknowledge in, in your field, like everything on materials, circular materials, is a different approach. It needs a lot of resources, time, expertise that goes in there, right? You spend a lot of time in the lab environment developing something. Is that also something that corporates and other players need to understand, a different approach towards developing solutions that just take longer? Exactly. I mean, um, that is for most of our customers uh, unusual to to not have ready solutions, but they ha have such a high demand and pain that, I mean, that we're not the only ones, right? So there are many startups at the moment, for example, working with biomaterials, this novel generation of materials, but they are still at our stage, uh, more or less. So um, the corporates are, yeah, they, they more and more get uh, get to these new concepts to, to work together with startups in that form. But I mean, what's happening, what we can see in the news these days, for example, what's happening is that some industries just um, shout to, to the government and ask uh, them for, I don't know, subsidies and ask them for solutions and lean back to say, do something, otherwise we can't change. And I think this is the wrong mindset. We, everyone and every, we had this before as well in, in, on the stage here. So CEOs of, of this country, they need to start at their own company and, and start finding solutions themselves uh, rather than just saying, okay, there's no solution out there. Um, we can't change anything. Or then give it over to our oh, regulation should fix it. Sometimes yeah. it's also to sit back and relax and give the responsibility to somebody else. Maybe there's also a different perspective on the funding part because money is always interesting in that context, right? Everybody's curious about funding. Also here, um, we had a good discussion and Anna and I, we've been in part of the Respond program of BMW Foundation. We had a talk two days ago with the Respond crew where we've been talking about different approaches to funding because we see a lot of also venture capital going into impact startups. Is that the right approach? Because you have taken also a different approach because you might need different capital that gives you a little bit more air to breathe. Yeah, I mean, this is another tool. Um, for one tool for increasing solutions, regenerative solutions is to demand them and to ask for them and to work with these companies. But the other tool is money, of course. I mean, startups like us, we need money. and. Um, that is um, especially in the growth phase and especially for hardware companies as us. I mean, we are building plants. We are producing this material ourselves in our plants. So we need a huge amount of money. And um, this is especially in, in, our, in, in the VC and investor world we see at the moment, uh, especially in Germany, quite difficult because it's still um, favored to invest in software and also governmental and, and uh, federal um, vehicles to support these growth stages of startups like us, like hardware startups like us, are not enough to, to overcome this valley of death, how it's called. Mm. Um, so th it's a huge problem, of course. Yeah. And you mentioned you need a lot of money. I think that's interesting. Without going in the numbers, everybody would be curious how much money would you need. But 
in the end, you're also competing a lot, of course, with the traditional petrochemical industries that are producing plastics. And I found stunning numbers when you look at how much they actually invest into their facilities. So they are building huge facilities. Saudi Aramco, for example, in India, 44 billion US dollars going into that facility. I think you're still a little bit far away from that in terms of funding, but it's also interesting to put this into perspective, right? Because you want to get this big, not to create a next unicorn, but to create really big impact. So how do you make that happen then? I mean, yeah, we're using the tools that are available. And of course, I mean, we last year received the German Founders Award and that gave us a lot of a huge push. And I think we are in a quite prevalent uh, solution that uh, position that we achieved it to to receive that funding but there are many startups left and right from us also with great hardware solutions who, who didn't receive the funding because especially now i mean the financial market is not the best for startups at the moment so and yeah on the other hand we have these huge oil companies who have billions to that where they could invest and they, they are investing in technologies at the moment so at the moment it's a a really crucial time because these companies and especially the chemical industry is like reinvesting at the moment in in their in their facilities in their plants and it's now the question for which technology they will decide so what is the um the the picture we have for our uh, for our future for for solving the problems of climate crisis and and resource uh, circularity so what are the technologies to solve it and they, they, the decisions that these companies will make and also the government and, and everyone else involved in the next two to five years, they decide for plan in investments and in plans that will then uh, last for, for the next 50 years. It's yeah. such a crucial time at the moment. Yeah, fundamental time. But also we... Yeah, Carla, you want yeah I wanted to add that it's more and more important that companies... Uh, break up the, the the old structures and try out something new because we have the old big industries uh, that doesn't move at this time maybe in the future but uh, this is why the, the big companies have to to try out something new innovative materials um, then if not we have uh, the the big industries the old industries like the chemistry industry that doesn't move and we don't solve the problem and, and maybe to add there, it's, it's quite interesting because that is a good example that makes it quite easy to understand. When Otto now shifts away from virgin plastics to I don't know, our material, wild plastic, reuse, whatever system, there's no plastic required or demanded anymore from company Otto in that case. So if we want to have a functioning circular economy where we, where we keep our existing materials in cycle, we don't. We need less, and this uh, um, our colleague from Greenpeace just said in the panel before. We need less virgin materials. So, what's the future of these companies then that produce virgin materials? They need to completely change their business model. We don't need so many virgin materials anymore. So, need as as we said has been said as before on this panel. Um, they need to become more of a service provider. They need to become part of. For example, mechanical recycling or design for recycling. They need to reinvent themselves, reinvent their whole business model. Otherwise, it will not work. If we grow as we plan to grow 1 million tons in 2030, that is already really ambitious, but we, are growing, we want to grow fast and build more plants, 1 million t tons in 2030, the plastics industry also wants to grow in this speed globally. So the, the plan is to, have to, to triple the amount of virgin plastic produced until 2060 to over a billion tons per year. These numbers, they do not match. Yes. So at the same time, when we are here in, in, this, in this bubble, uh, when we want to call it that way because there's another huge fossil industry, if we are creating solutions for a functioning circular economy and at the same time, this virgin material industry is producing more and more virgin material, that doesn't work. It's interesting because also that links back to what Maya Goebel said this morning. She had one word, acceleration. So of course you want to accelerate the impactful solutions, but the world around is also probably accelerating with more harmful solutions and doing business as normal. When we then think about the role of companies also, just to distinguish Otto, like a different role than the petrochemical companies. I mean, you can support these partnerships, which is, I would say, vital. In the end, this led to Traceless. Also, it's a funding role and the financing role in the end, right? Because you, 
think of funding not just in terms of you get cash, equity, whatever, but revenues. You want to make revenues at some point in time. So that's also a tremendous role of, of companies. How do you see that? How do you see your role from an auto point of view to, to facilitate more change even in that direction? Yeah, I see the role. As you said, uh, we are a huge player. We can we can support uh, startups, innovative uh, materials uh, to grow, to to finance the the idea, and uh, we can work together to create a solution that fits to to especially to the companies. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, a very good matchmaking to have this uh, big company together with the the small company uh, to work together on on the solution to have the innovative uh, perspective and the <clears throat> and the uh, maybe a, a little bit old perspective uh, the old structures uh, to mix it together mm -hmm. and yeah yeah exactly and i mean maybe to give it a little bit more positive uh, perspective not what it just said i mean the, how can we change it let's look at the automotive industry i mean for also for decades um they stick to the um like old uh, old technology but then when Two things happened. One is regulation, but second is also demand, demand from end consumers for electrical cars. Then the shift started. So I think, and, and that's needed. I mean, and competition, uh, three things. So competition, um, demand from end consumers. Uh, in this case also, I mean, the, the corporates, like the, the brand owners are the co the customers for, for, the chem for these uh, chemical industries. Yeah. Um, and regulation is so important. Yeah. Yeah, so on the customer side, but then let's look also on the other players, because when we talked, you mentioned that this transformation would not work without the chemical industry, the petrochemical industry. So how do we get them to move? What are the big triggers there? <laughs> what, what, what? Good question. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> the, the billion, the trillion dollar question, do you have the trillion dollar answer on that? Because it's fundamental, right? Yeah. I mean, that became clear now even. Yeah, I mean... Um in the end, I think it's, it, it starts in the heads, uh, heads of the people and uh, who have the power, because if they think only in Q4, then they will stick to the old technology. But I think, yeah, regulation is one point. Um, we, we need to have a, a vision for, for Europe, for, for 2040 Europe circular economy. What is the part, uh, the, the, the uh, role of the chemical industry, for example, in this vision in 2040, like a realistic role? Um, we need to, to draw that together and we also need to include these companies in our bubble. It needs to be one joint vision. But that's interesting, right? Because if we would ask everybody here, how would that vision look like 2040 when it comes to these industries, we would probably have a similar picture. Yeah. Now this kind of work is also happening. We talked about regulation. Maybe that's also something on a way you can give a little bit insight because at the ministry level, EU level, a lot of things are happening. <laughs> But we have also all these different forces who somehow need to develop a joint vision, which sometimes is a contradiction and a dilemma, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, I don't want to be a politician in these times. Um, <laughs> who wants to be a politician <laughs> in these times? Hands up. Um, um, One question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, times are getting tougher and tougher. And I mean, we heard Maya Goebel in the morning that um, we want to like keep our, our wealth, which we worked so hard for in the past decades, but we also heard her to say, okay, what is that worth, worth, uh, worth when we don't have food anymore? And uh, so continuing the business as usual from the, chem from the big industry, fossil in industries, will lead to a, to a lot lower wealth in, in the future. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot going on at the moment. And um, this, uh, you, you, are list, you, are, you are seeing the news that um, a lot of subsidies are demanded from the fossil industry. And I think that needs to be now very closely connected to demands for transition, demands for real transition towards a, a realistic future scenario for that industry. Okay, that's, that's a good point. And, and certainly good examples, impactful examples help a lot. So maybe Carla, also there to you. You're now creating these examples. How can you maybe leverage your work and also influence other companies, competitors or other industries by showing good solutions that people also get fascinated about, right? We want to tell also a different narrative. How do you see that? Any, any plans that you do, any things that you do in that direction? Yeah, that's necessary. Uh, we have to talk with other companies. We have to make collaboration to, to, to make a big uh, impact uh, in the industry. And we have to talk with the uh, government. We have to talk with uh, our producing industries. And uh, then we can make uh, yeah, a big picture, a big solution that we uh, change. Yeah. 
And it will be really interesting to observe what will happen on the national level, right? When we think about the regulation, what's driving, especially in Germany, a lot of things happening right now. Yes, exactly. I mean, it, it is happening at the moment that there are a lot of talks in that direction with politics and, and industries um, and short term solution will be found long term solution, especially as, as well. But I just want to emphasize here that um, I mean, and we are also as a startup involved um, in, in the political d uh, discussion because they also want to hear the um, perspective of the regenerative like new ideas and startup ideas. But um, what is very important for me to say is that we don't go there alone as a startup with a crazy idea. But I mean, we have the backing of business models that are here in, in, in this room, in, in, this, in this fair, which are great examples that circular economy and uh, cradle to cradle design and all these great initiatives and ideas you have here are the answer, are the, the, the alternative to just producing more uh, virtual material. So, just, this is what we are also. We will also take in these discussions when we, um, yeah, are involved um, in in the in the talks with politics and industry, the backing of these great ideas and and examples we see here. And I think it's great to hear that you are then involved and that we find a voice in these discussions. I think fundamentally important. And as I said before, really important to have these positive showcase examples. So I would say at this point in time, thank you very much to both of you for taking us into alternative solutions. I think we have a better idea of what your goals are for 2030 for Traceless. We have that numbers. We have a little bit of an idea that we need to work on 2040 vision for the petrochemical industry, not only, but beyond, right? Well, how does that look like? Interesting question for all of us to think about. And with this, I would say thank you very much, Anna and Carla, and big applause for this great discussion. Thank you very much.